The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. I am independent journalist Georgia Four in for Ben Dixon. This morning, it's important for us to have a conversation as parents are beginning to feel like they have no other choice but then to send their children back to school. It's fall in some states. We know that school is already beginning to resume and up north school will resume next month. So what are your options when you know that your children are going to be in classrooms filled with other kids who have haven't been vaccinated. What does that mean for your family's health? What does that mean for the pandemic? And truly, are there any other options? That brings us to our guest this morning, Anthony Galloway, Dr. Mack, and Adrian Ashby. Adrian, I want to begin with you uh, because it's this is your first time on the show, and also because you have been homeschooling your children for nearly a decade, correct? Yes, that's right. We started in 2012, and this will be our 10th year homeschooling. And I I know for some parents that might feel intimidating, you know, taking that on. Uh, Could you just for those who have never tried to homeschool but are finding themselves kind of like in a rock and a hard place and really don't want to send their kids back? Can you just share with them uh, how you and your husband arrived at the decision to homeschool and um, how you guys have found so much success in doing so? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Georgia. Um, We started homeschooling in 2012, but honestly, I researched it probably four years before that, just because that's the type of person that I am. Um, I needed to convince myself that this was doable. Um, And so the the main reason I started was that I had met some um, homeschoolers when we lived in the Atlanta area. I met homeschooling families, and I just really thought that their kids were great. Their kids got along with my kids. And my oldest um, is a boy, and he was, I think, in kindergarten at the time. And I was concerned about the plight of Black boys in public schools. And I wanted to try to figure out what other options he might have or we might have um, for his education. And so that was the reason that we started this whole thing. I started researching. And ultimately, when we moved back to Virginia in 2012, I was able to to start homeschooling when my um, my oldest by that time was in fifth grade and then my middle child was in third grade and my youngest I think was three or four at that time so he was actually still going to um, preschool and you have since um, you know raised your kids you guys have done homeschooling they are now off to college can you share with us some of the um, achievements that they've made that you're most proud of Sure. Um, The biggest achievement, I think, is that I feel like my son who graduated in 2020 um, went out into the world. So our mission for our homeschool, our mission statement is to develop young adults who love God and their neighbor and who are prepared to engage the world with compassion, creativity and critical insight. So that's what we're trying to do here in our homeschool. And so I feel like we launched our first kid off and I feel like he had those qualities, compassion, creativity, and critical insight. Um, He actually got an appointment to the United States Coast Guard Academy. Um, So we just dropped him off on June 28th. We dropped him off at the US Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. Um, He applied to 11 schools. 11 colleges and he got into nine of them. So a lot of people would call that success and it is success of a type. Um, It lets us know that his education didn't suffer by homeschooling, but the things that I think people don't see is that um, he's the kid that we get reports back saying, you know, Solomon really helped out his classmates. He took the lead when something needed, you know, to be done, all of those things. That was part of Mm -hmm. what we were trying to build here while we were homeschooling. Now, Adrian, you know, as your as your as your children were advancing, let's say you started fifth, sixth grade. At what point did you know that they had passed or mastered the requirements to move from one grade to another? And and then ultimately, when it came to college, um, did they 
S-H-E, A-C-T, you know, so just tell us how did uh, did you all understand the mastery of moving from one grade to the next? And then even how you developed the curriculum or did you find the curriculum somewhere? So in Virginia, and each state differs, each state has its own homeschooling laws. In Virginia, we're required to um, test our children or have them evaluated by a licensed teacher every year. So for my kids, I always gave them every year the Iowa test of basic skills, which I know some people probably remember from when they were in school, which is a a nationally normed standardized test. And so I would give them that test at the end of the year, get the results back and send that into the school district. And we would get the results back and see they would break down for math and language arts, what percentile your children were in, you know, so compare it to the national you know, all the kids who took the test at that time, what percentile they were in. So that gave us good feedback. Um, And it also gave us language to speak with people who may not understand homeschooling. Most people understand standardized test results. Um, When it came to college admission, what we did, so when you homeschool, you're sort of the guidance counselor, you're the principal, you're the teacher, you're the lunch lady, you're the whole thing. And so um, in preparing for my son to go to college, we did the PSAT just as um, as people do. We um, did the PSAT, we had him sit for the SAT and I had to keep records of every course you know, that we taught at home and keep detailed descriptions of that course because unlike people who go to school with homeschoolers, if I say I taught my child algebra one, they wanna see a description of the course the colleges, they want to see um, the title of the book that we used or any resources that we used. So I had probably about a 12 page um, description, course description, like you would see in colleges. You know, this course will teach these things um, and a transcript. And so we had to create that. I have one now for my daughter who's 17. So we're in the process. She's going to be applying to colleges um, in the fall. So we're in the process of keeping those. And um, I hired another homeschool mom, black homeschool mom, who specializes in college counseling for homeschoolers. So she was able to take all of the information that I gleaned over the years about my about my son and turn it into something that colleges understand. So by the time it was time for college admissions, we had a nice packet that we could submit to colleges in a way that they understood it. Now, I feel like for some people, this might, you know, feel really intimidating. And Anthony, I'd love to hear from you on this. Um, When you think about going back to school, right, there's this concern of children not being vaccinated and what that means for our kids, what that means for our communities um, and and what that means for us as parents. There are so many parents out here who are busy juggling their careers and can't imagine uh, taking this this type of burden on, but are also now looking at, oh, my goodness, I, I don't want my kids to school go to school either. And and what you've shared with us, Adrian, is maybe it's not a, a burden at all. Maybe this is something that would really produce dividends, um, not only for our children's futures, uh, but for us as well. Anthony, you as a father uh, who, you know, you're facing the same decision, what is this bringing up for you? Well, also, also as a father and as a minister, one of the things that I'm finding is that more people are making this choice and that people have been making this choice for a long time. You know, I think, uh, Sister Adrian, one of the things that you've just done ex- excellently is debunk some of the myths uh, that folks have out there about homeschooling. Um, you know, myths that homeschool kids are less prepared. They don't stay on track with their public school or private school counterparts. They don't go to college. None of those things are true. In fact, we see pretty much the the opposite of that, you know, um, and so as as a father for, for for us, this is a serious option that we're thinking about because our kids are younger uh, than the vaccination age. They're both under 12. And so, you know, and uh, they did not did not enjoy um, it it, 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 last year's uh, online schooling as much as everybody was trying to make to make happen did not work for them. 
And so we would much rather um, follow the 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 um, follow the direction of some of our, our friends and colleagues and, and about 20 percent of the uh, Center for the African Diaspora that I run, 20 percent of the parents in that uh, program in that at that center are homeschool and they use our center for the companion enrichment. So 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 it's a serious option that we're really considering um, for for this year, at least for the portion of the year uh, before the before they can get vaccinated, at least. The other piece of that that is in here in the state of Minnesota, where we live, um, there are very there's a whole lot of resources. In fact, there's a whole department of homeschool in our Department of Education. So another myth that Sister Adrian, I'm so glad that you debunked, is that somehow when you homeschool that there is no connection with other school entities. And here, at least in the state of Minnesota, that's just not true. And so, you know, I, I think it's not only a viable option for many of the families in, in, in my circle, um, it's, it's the only option and the best option. The only other thing that I'll add to that is one of the things that we've seen alleviated with our students, not necessarily, particularly students of color, in particular, Black and Indigenous students here in Minnesota um, is that a lot of the other situations that they that our students find in school racially were not experienced this past year. And we've I've seen a huge benefit to my children's mental health, not having to navigate a school where in addition to all of the excellence that they want to strive for, they also have to deal with the racialized incidents that are happening at, at their school as well. So, so there's just so many um, checkbox being marked on our direction towards homeschooling. So, so, so brother Anthony and, and sister Adrian, you know, and, and I'm, I'm with Georgia, you know, Adrian, as you were describing what you were doing, I'm like, my Lord, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer and I just don't think that I could have dealt with that. So, so in, in going through all that you went through, are there financial, are there financial resources? I know for kids that go to public schools, there's so much money that's allocated per school. Uh, given that states are recognizing homeschools, are there financial resources to help you all as parents if you dis if, if a parent elects to go down the, the route of homeschooling? In the state of Virginia, there are not. But I know at least one state, that state is Alaska, where I think parent families get $1,500 a year that they can use toward homeschooling. And that can include extracurriculars, you know, dance classes, art classes. It can include curriculum. Um, one thing I will say, when the when the COVID pandemic happened in 2020, a lot of Black parents started um, started thinking about this homeschooling thing. And so in various Facebook groups I was in, people were passing my name around. I think I was contacted by no less than 30 um, Black parents who were seeking information about how to homeschool their children um, last summer. And what I always told them was that really homeschooling is just a part of our lives. Like, you know, from the time your kids are born, you're actually educating them as you walk along the way. Like you're not you're not saying, OK, we're going to talk about math, but you're cooking and you're saying, look, I'm taking one fourth teaspoon of this and one fourth teaspoon of that. That's math, even though it doesn't sound like it is, even though they're not sitting at a desk. So I would tell people and we had lots of people contact me who were full time, both parents working full time and trying to figure out how they could do it. But because everyone was home because of the pandemic, people really didn't have a choice. And so their question was, do I do the online thing that the school is offering or do I figure out a way to make the learning come alive more with homeschooling? And so that's what I started getting in the habit of walking people through. And I would ease their minds by saying, start out with just language arts and math. Don't worry about bringing in all of the other things. Just start out really slowly. But even before you start out with all the academics, start getting to know your child, figuring out what makes that child tick. Because when our kids are away from us for eight hours a day, that's time we're not figuring out who they are. They're, you know, they're not getting to figure out who we are. And so take some time to get to know your kids. COVID really taught us that there is no rush for all of this, right? If your kid has to take their time through a math subject, um, let them. That's what homeschooling allows them. They're not competing against the person next to them to make sure that they finish the assignment as fast. They're learning at their own pace. Okay, and, and to both of you, you know, let's, let's say you're struggling with a certain subject as a parent, math, science, chemistry, whatever it is. What did you do in the cases of subjects that you didn't feel you had a mastery of yet you're now trying to teach this particular course? You know, this, so, oh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say for um, as the kids got older, we had we have them test into community college. So um, my oldest son did several math, starting with pre-calculus at community college. He did his physics at community college. Um, for the younger kids, let's just say if I didn't, if I wasn't really interested, like art has never been my strong suit at home. We joined a co-op, a homeschool co-op, which is basically a collective of parents um, who get together and say, you know what? For example, I taught U.S. government. I'm an attorney. So I taught U.S. government at that at that co-op. But another mom who's um, a math specialist taught my son math and another mom taught French. And so it's sort of a pooling of resources um, mm-hmm. that went on so that the kids are still getting what they want. And they're getting taught by someone who loves the subject. Um, and I'm not having to do it. I'm just sort of in the background coaching that part. Go ahead, Anthony. Sorry. Well, I, I was just going to going to co I'm going to co-sign you because um, with the center that I run, one of the things that we do is we coordinate pods. And so um, it was easy, actually, in the in the transition to the online learning, um, because we already had these pods that were already set up. And so during the day, um, we, we open up our center and there are folks who use uh, the center to do the co-op uh, work that you just described, in addition to just meeting up. Um, um, and what I also found um, really, really um, interesting about that, not just the the co- the, the community college, um, you know, uh, plug you just made here in Minnesota, we have quite a bit of community colleges. And so and so that just works. But um, we also have a robust uh, PSEO post-secondary education options uh, process here in in Minnesota as well. And we find a, a huge number of homeschool kids take advantage of that. But the other piece that 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 comes along with that um, in in to your question, Dr. Mack, is is um, how many teachers that we actually find in the cohorts themselves. So folks um, either who have done who have taught for a while. We also have folks, aunts and uncles and things like that, who had been teachers who may have retired, who can drop in for one class because they miss it so much. There's just there's a there's a plethora of resources that. I just through the uh, parents who are utilizing these pods at our center, finding that this resource was there. I, I would also add, and I think you, you alluded to this a little bit, you know, being in there just coaching in the background. Um, there is also this nexus of parents getting to talk to each other about so many other um, issues and things like that that were coming up. It was actually a very much a cooperative model, not just from the education side, but also to the mental health. Um, there are parents in there, in there who were psychologists. There are parents who um, were youth specialists and developers. And so they were able to put together these opportunities that, quite frankly, I was a little jealous of because my kids were going to full-time school when I first learned about these pods. And then we were able to access them when we were online to the point where our kids actually enjoyed that part. And whenever time came for the online portion with school, we'd see that tank. We'd see their energy tank. We'd see their will tank and all of those things. Mm. Um, And so mommy math class was so much more enjoyable than the one online. I love it. And Adrian, you know, I'm I'm curious to know from you because you started homeschooling well before the pandemic. So this wasn't something that you just stumbled into as a result of this pandemic. This is something that your family chose to do many, many, many years before it. Uh, for those who are uh, walking into this and they're trying to figure it out, do you have any advice on how to also keep your home safe while you're homeschooling? schooling because there still is a pandemic that's going on. Uh, Were there measures that you guys put in place uh, as you were homeschooling to keep yourself and the kids safe if there were anyone else in the house that was leaving out to go to work or if you're having guest teachers who are coming in? How do you deal with COVID uh, while you're homeschooling? Well, once um, COVID happened, all of our co-ops stopped. You know, the co-ops went virtual, just like a lot of schools did. And so we were home. The good news for us is that we've been doing this for all for all these years. So we knew we knew the drill of what you know, of what to do. Um, So the kids and I were not going out of the house. Really, my husband was the only person who was going out of the house. And he was making sure you know, that he masked and he washed up when he came home and all of those things. Um, The thing about COVID. So. Most homeschoolers, a lot of people worry about if they homeschool their child, where the, will, their, will their child have enough opportunities to socialize with other people, right? What people don't know is that homeschoolers 
are constantly socializing with other people to the point where when COVID happened, we were like, wait a minute, we can't go to the park. We can't go to the museum. We can't meet up with our, it was like all the things that we spend all our time out of the house doing, we couldn't do. And so that part, I think that part was challenging for us. So a lot of that stuff moved online. Um, and so we were able to sort of keep the kids safe, keep the kids home. And if there was some socializing that took place, it would be outside. Okay. And, and so even with that, was there a requirement, you know, not a COVID hit, was there a requirement amongst the co-op parents to say, we have to get our children vaccinated or was that a personal choice? You know, how did you all deal with that? That aspect. Of so, it? so we're starting a co-op. We're in the process of starting a um, black led co-op now. Um, sort of we're opening in late August. It's called Kindred Homeschool Collective. Um, me and three other moms got together and said, you know, we've had we've had our children in co-ops in um, where we were the only black family in most of the co-ops. And, and now we think we want something different for our children. So we're having to really think deeply about how do we how do we make this thing happen for our kids, given the Delta variant and all of those things. And so we're actually in active meetings about that, um, creating our own COVID policy um, with regard to masking and social distancing. We're blessed in our community to have a nurse who's one of the moms in our co-op and a woman, um, a public health specialist in our co-op. So along with them, we're like formulating our plan to, um, so that the kids can have the opportunity to meet each other and learn from these awesome classes and not have to, um, and also for the parents, honestly, it's, it's really about us parents getting together as Anthony was saying and talking amongst ourselves and sharing informal mentorship opportunities. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and, and Anthony, the, 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 let me, let me ask this question, Anthony. When I think of homeschool, I, you know, my mind is so antiquated of just thinking, you know, mom or dad is there in the house, in the home, and they're just drilling this into the child. The child never leaves the house. They're just being subjected to schooling this whole time. So on, under this new homeschooling concept, how is social interacting integrated into the homeschooling aspect of your child's education? So, so I can only speak to this from being a center who's who's been involved in some of the enrichment portions of this. But when we, um, I, I just want to <laughs> double down on something that Sister Adrian said earlier and run the socialization side. It is a complete fallacy. It's a myth that homeschooled children are less social socialized or are more socially awkward. It just it, it doesn't pan out in any real research, even though anecdotally you may hear it from some 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 educators. I'm sorry. That's just not the case. When kids come to us at the Center for the African Diaspora, um, they're not any less socialized. Actually, what we find is that the more intricate socialized skills, the deeper ones that actually matter long term, we actually see our home, the homeschool population of the kids who come to our center excelling. They're the mediators. They're the folks who 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 get the deeper social emotional uh, pieces that are there. So I just I, I need to underscore that, um, you know, so we just don't we just don't see that 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 assumption there in terms of the uh, of the quote unquote drill and kill again. We see this as a practice more indicative of public school education than we do in the homeschool side. It just it just doesn't pan out, at least for the kids who come who come through the center and are in our uh, particularly our black homeschool networks here in Minnesota. Um, every we folks stay together. They know each other. They 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 connect uh, across and are continuing. There's a black homeschool. Minnesota dot com is a is a resource guide for black families here in our space. And so I, I just I just want to push around that that socialization myth that somehow only by sticking kids together in a school in a, in a, in a with rigid schedule from eight in the morning to 3 p.m. is the only way that kids gain socialization skills. Um, if that were the case, then folks in many schools wouldn't be paying so much money to try to train around social emotional learning help. And guess what? A whole lot of the homeschool folks and, and kids can can and, and parents can speak to that very easily. So I, I think 
you know, that's that's an important thing to, to think about as well. The other piece that we have here is we have a strong park system. Uh, Sister Adrian, I know I heard you talk about um, that park system. We have one of the strongest park systems in the nation here in Minnesota. And one of the things that you will find very often is homeschool no- networks, pods, cohorts, however, you know, folks I, I identify with them, making use of that in ways that um, are, are, is, is, is pretty extraordinary. So I can walk here in the state of Minnesota. I can, you know, and I've seen this, uh, happen have been a part of these groups we have a, a site called the bedote it's the sacred origin site of the dakota peoples the native american peoples here in minnesota it's also the site for the concentration camp that was there it's also the site of fort snelling the first big fort in the state of minnesota it's also the site where the first black flotilla of refugees came to minnesota to uh, for community establishment right and so um i'm sitting there uh with a group of pastors planning a uh an international uh prayer service uh, that's going to happen in a few years. And there's a homeschooling cohort pot of groups that are coming through. And we stopped and just listened because as this group was coming through, I'm watching homeschool parents teach about the history that folks are fighting to get taught in our schools. So, you know, there's just, there are so many things that happen in the homeschool spaces that, that we often will hold on to myths about from socialization to what's actually covered. And, and, and I think sister Adrian, you're doing an excellent job debunking some of those myths. The, the only other piece that I'll add real quickly is just that one of the things that we're thinking about is both myself, and my wife have the ability, and I have this wondering for you, Sister Adrian, about how work happens in this. Because I think one of the other myths is that it takes one parent staying at home completely to do this. Um, and we we found because we had the ability to work from home that we just made a schedule, mapped out a schedule, and that was how how we made that work. And it, we still were able to stay full time, especially now that more more and more companies and offices are allowing folks to work from home. I'm wondering how that worked for you because I've seen many creative ways that that happened in the cohorts that I've seen. Well, I work, um, so I still practice law. I work from home. So I practice law about 20 hours a week. Um, One thing that people don't realize about homeschooling is that homeschooling does not take the long amount of time that school a school day does right so people's kids are in school from eight to three or something like that and they're thinking oh my goodness if I homeschool I need seven hours worth of time in order to educate my child that's just not true there's a lot of time in school that is spent in non-educational time right we think about all the things that we did in school that were not time learning um so what I do I, to make it work I get up early in the morning as probably a lot of parents do um I get some time in with my work then. And then once my kids are up, we sort of have a relaxed schedule around here. Once my kids are up, we have our morning meeting. That's when we um, sit around the table. We talk, we sing, we read poetry, we pray, all that stuff. And um, and then we talk about what's going to happen for the day. And then I'll work with them in their one-on-one things, um, especially for about the 12-year-old, maybe two or three hours, literally worth of work is probably a whole school day or more worth um, for a public school student. And then I usually spend the afternoons doing my work. And the kids at that time can be doing their individual subjects. They can be reading, doing some type of art. My um, youngest son is very into growing things now, growing plants and all of that stuff. Any of that. Um, Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create independent learners, kids that that leave this house and continue learning for their whole life, lifelong learners, right? Once you leave, once you leave school, you no longer have teachers. You sort of got to seek out for yourself how to learn things. And the sooner I feel like a kid learns how to find information and teach themselves, the better off they are. I I, I I have, I have some experience with the academies that went and I've been to, to the Coast Guard Academy, uh, in New London, uh, right there on the Thames River. As a matter of fact, I was on one of the Coast Guard Academy's uh, sailboats when Commandant Papp was the Commandant of the Coast Guard. But, you know, and I, I don't, I, I really want to to highlight the fact of, of the fact that your, your son uh, got into the Coast Guard Academy because that education is somewhere around north of $350,000 of which, if I'm not mistaken, you won't have to pay one penny for that education. Is that, yes. is that correct? <laughs> That's right. Yes. He has to do five years in the Coast Guard after that, after he graduates. But yes, we do not have to pay that. Congratulations. 
Well, and what I was going to say is uh, that uh, Ben Dixon has been watching and he said he's been very intrigued by all of the information um, that you've shared and would love to plug in because shout out to his wife, Jada, who has been homeschooling uh, their children and doing an amazing job. But Adrian, as you pointed out, it really does take that collective and that cooperative. So I hope that those of you who have been watching from home, what you take away from this conversation if you're a parent is that you have options that you don't have to feel pressured into sending your kids back to school and dealing with all of the vaccinations and i think that this is the perfect time you guys know that we're on the clock and um and my kids are waking up so um we're gonna head out Uh, but if you're watching stick around for more on the benjamin dixon show Like the ocean, love you in slow motion. Anything it takes to make you stay. But I can't rely Welcome back. I wanted to bring into the conversation um, journalist Mary Poppenfoos. She is a journalist for the Huffington Post. And I want to talk about her article, which intersects, unfortunately, with everything that we're discussing this morning. Um, she's covering the Texas Senate bill that's dropping the teaching requirement that the Ku Klux Klan is, quote unquote, morally wrong. Now, we discussed this on the show this week and a little bit uh, last week. Mary, thank you so much for joining us this morning. How are you? My pleasure. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Tell us about um, your research into it. Um, we've been covering it because of the absurdity of it, right? The suggestion that that there is some type of um, moral equivalence and therefore we should not discuss the immorality of what was clearly an immoral institution or is yeah. because it's still with us. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it was shocking. Actually, I wasn't the first one who covered it. You know, the Texas papers had the story Friday and they talked to a lot of people talked about white supremacy and that um, white supremacy was no longer to be considered or n- no longer to be taught as morally wrong. And I looked at the bill and um, I-, I think my story was picked up because I picked up the part about the uh, KKK. Um, I have just thought, why not go right to it? Because that's what's at the heart of this bill. And mm-hmm. I think there's something so horrifying about the Klan. And to see those, we have these great historical photos of the Klan that I pull out when I can, because I think they just strike terror into everybody's heart. And that's what we're talking about. I mean, our house is on fire. Um, I, I, I'm sure this is going on elsewhere, but Texas put it in black and white. And, and it took me a while. I, there was an earlier bill that was passed. It was a House bill that was passed. Um, I, I think the governor signed it in June, and that had the list of the curriculum. And I saw the Senate bill, and I thought, well, where, where is it? What, what did they cut? So it took mm-hmm. me a while. It took me about a day to compare the two uh, bills. And there's a long list of cuts. I mean, they cut the Emancipation Proclamation. They cut every, every woman, every woman's name of the required curriculum, every person of color's name. The, they cut out the entire Native American history. And of course, the, you know, the most shocking was that, but was it white supremacy, uh, including but not limited to eugenics and the Ku Klux Klan, would not be would not be taught and it would not be discussed as morally wrong. Hmm. So I this is just like gr- ground zero of what's happening in this country, I think. Mm. And they were Br- dumb enough to put it in writing. <laughs> Br- 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 Mac. You know, you know, so you have to go back and ask the question then is murder morally wrong? Mm. Nobody yeah. could argue that. So, you know, from a historical perspective, let's let's understand when the Klan came into formation. The Civil War is lost, which now, you know, and, and you give, go back to January 1st, 1863, when Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. So, yeah, let's, let's strip that as well. Uh, but then after the, the, the end of the Civil War, April 9th, 1865, now you got the passage of the 13th Amendment on December 6th, 1865. That loss was so devastating that now six ex-Confederate officers meet down in Pulaski, Tennessee on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 
and they find this little group known as the Ku Klux Klan. So now let's come more into modern day and let's talk about the morality. Just a couple of cases of the morality behind the Ku Klux Klan. Most of us are familiar with the 16th Street bombing, but I need people to understand how horrific it was. So September 5th, 1963, Addie Mae Collins, a 14-year-old little black girl, Carol Robinson, 14-year-old little black girl, Cynthia Wesley, a 14-year-old little black girl, Carol Denise McNair, an 11-year-old little black girl, died because of a bombing on November 18th, 1977. And if anybody wants to debate the morality of the Klan, just go ask the, li- the largest law enforcement investigative source in this country, the FBI, because the FBI has an incredible dossier on what immoral acts were committed by members of the Ku Klux Klan. So on April 18th, 1977, Robert Dynamite Bob Edwards Chambers was a known member of the Ku Klux Klan, and he was convicted of first-degree murder. Now, again, if murder is not a moral issue, then I don't know what is. Now come back to, to the state of Mississippi, those three civil rights workers. We're talking about James Cheney, Andrew Goldman, Michael uh, Shawarner. August 3rd, 1964, there was an informant who was a former, who was a Mississippi Highway Patrol who's now deceased by the name of Maynard King. That's he was known as Mr. X to the FBI. He told them, and keep in mind, they had been looking for these civil rights workers for a long time. You had local state authorities. You even had 400 United States sailors looking for these bodies. But on August 3rd, Mr. X tells the FBI where the bodies are located. The next day, they find the the bodies of these three civil rights workers. November 1964, 21 men, based on this informant's uh, uh, information to the FBI, 21 men are convicted, are charged with murder. The state of Mississippi, and they knowing they were Klan members, the state of Mississippi refused to bring charges against them. So on October 6, 1967, in a case... United States versus Cecil Price. And, but who was Cecil Price? Cecil Price was a deputy sheriff in the Shelby County. Yes. Yep. Yeah, I want to. I want let me jump. Let me let me let me let me jump in there and, and, and grab it only because uh, we have a, 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 a Mary for a, a, a limited amount of time. But I, okay. I need to couch it in that history, right? right? So there is a clear Mary. There is a clear historical precedent for the immorality. I yes. mean, the receipts go on and on and on and on. But there's a game that is being played that has very deadly consequences. And it's a game of, are they trying to get away with a whataboutism? Are they trying to say um, that it's all a wash? Or are they simply saying, we don't care that you know that the KKK is immoral. We're taking a firm stand on the side of the KKK in your research. You know, I I think they're trying to thread the needle. I mean, outrageously, when some of these politicians were asked about this, they would say, well, we haven't banned the teaching that the KKK is immoral. It's like, oh, okay, then we're all we're all good. Um, You know, some guy said they wanted to make a, a, a manageable list. They wanted to truncate the list a little bit. So they cut out all people of color, all women. And, you know, the one break was given to the white men in white sheets. I mean, it's appalling. Wow. And I, I got I got so much hate mail after this story. And people, one, they called me a liar without it, pointing out anything, just like it, it's a lie. So it's I'm, like um, if you I'm call sorry, the truth Mary, a lie. Sorry. Oh, yeah. You, you, you're saying that you personally received hate mail just for reporting on it. And you 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 weren't the original reporting. You found some subsequent reporting. And because of your subsequent reporting, you got hate mail. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I used the the clan in my headline and in my lead. And that I, that just pushed everybody's buttons. I mean, that just woke everybody up, I think. That's why everybody picked up my story, because I put the Klan in the top and people just I mean, I've never gotten a hate mail like that since I've been a journalist. And but Mary, I, 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 I would also say this, that if you take a traditional history book today and if you just open that history book 10 times, you're going to find exactly what those Texas uh, legislators did. You're going to find if you open it and you see 10 pictures. 
eight to nine of those pictures is going to be a white man. Very rarely are you going to see women and people of color. So what, what we're talking about now is revisionism. That is, in its simplest yes. terms, that is what they are doing That's uh, to, 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 to revise history. But you'll never be able to clean this up, which is why it is so important for us as a people to understand our history. And I want to applaud right. you for, for being able to put together such an article that strikes the moral consciousness and the nerves of America. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Let's do this. I want to play this clip real quick from... Um, uh, the 700 clubs pat robertson and he's discussing critical race theory and i want to have a, a brief chat about that and then we're going to be joined um uh, professor mac do me a favor and connect with uh, our producer david in the chat room we want to make sure we got that ball rolling uh but this is the, this is how much they fear critical race theory and you know what if people like this fear it that much maybe that's all the more reason we need to double and triple down on it let's take a look at it that the people of color have been oppressed by the white people. What? And the white people begin to be racist by the time they're uh, two or three months old. And they're, they, therefore, the people of color have to rise up and overtake their oppressors. And then, having gotten the whip handle, if I can use that term, then to instruct wow. their white neighbors how to behave. Now, that's critical race theory. Well, so actually it's not, but it does not sound that bad when you consider you all let 600,000 people die from COVID-19 because of your ignorance. When you consider the number of black people who are killed by police disproportionately. So when you consider when you consider the barbarism of Western civilization, you think about Christopher Columbus, you guys celebrate Christopher Columbus and we're in the Native Americans had to survive him. Right. When you really yeah. when you really do the sum total of what your culture has done, then perhaps that should be the interpretation of critical race theory. But it's not. No, nope. uh, it's or not. Brother, Professor Mac. Or, or Brother Dixon, let me tell you. <laughs> this is, you know, you brought me on to, to bring this his, you know, historical perspective. And I've never seen this brother talking about what he thinks is critical race theory. I don't know how old that footage is, but the reason I'm laughing is because what he's telling you is what white folks have thought from the day that they enslaved our people. He just told you exactly, I can pull a passage from Thomas Jefferson mm. saying exactly what he said, the mm. exact thing. Jefferson said, I tremble when I, mm -hmm. when, when I think of my God and God is a just God. Mm -hmm. and this and will just not go on forever. He says, I can view a, a day when the wheels of fortune would reverse, he said the exact same thing. <laughs> George Washington. Blacks fought in the American Revolution, you know, and so they the Congress decided, no, no, we're, we're going to kick them all out because they were afraid that based on the oppression that they was giving us. Now you want to arm us and say fight for us that we would do it. And then uh, Lord Dunmore of Virginia said to blacks in his Dunmore proclamation, any blacks that fight for us, we'll grant you your freedom. Shit, man, we went over there like 20,000 strong in a hurry, quick in a yeah. hurry. And then the Continental Congress changed it. Even Abraham Lincoln and this Congress, remember now when the Civil War started, they forbade blacks to take up arms and to fight for our own freedom. It was pressure from, from Thomas, uh, 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 Frederick Douglass, uh, Charles something that Thaddeus Stevens and those radical Republicans that just kept putting pressure on, on Lincoln that even in the Emancipation Proclamation, that's when he opened it up for us to fight. So mm. this fear of this revolution and this revenge factor that we may take has permeated through America from day one. And I'm telling you now that those who are against the critical race theory, they have that same level of fear. <laughs> it's mm. just yeah, Georgia, real quick on uh, I, I want to ask in context of the the Derek Chauvin um, sentencing mm -hmm. that we just that we just um, came across. And you were one of two journalists um, in the nation to be in that verdict, um, not the verdict, rather, but the uh, sentencing. I am I'm curious in in terms of the erasure and the whitewashing of, of history, um, because that defense attorney would really like to paint the picture of what happened to George Floyd. Um, he would like to whitewash Derek Chauvin 
and the bloody murder of uh, the brutal rather murder of George Floyd with the same whitewashing brushes America has done Christopher Columbus and uh, uh, Western culture and civilization, all the things that they celebrate. They really would like to rewrite the history for Derek Chauvin, wouldn't they? Oh, yeah. Uh, you you saw that day in and day out of the trial uh, every day, attorney Nelson coming in and basically saying that there was no way George Floyd died from a knee on his neck, that it was due to drugs and it was due to the positive COVID tests and all of these other absurd things. Uh, and he actually had uh, different experts come in and help try to tell that story. Mm. Uh, even all the way up to sentencing where we saw Derek Chauvin's mother come in and reaffirm that he's a good man mm. and uh, really just not even acknowledge what happened so much so to a fault where I don't know if you guys noticed when we play that clip, she said on November 25th, I don't know where that woman has been, but <laughs> right. this incident did not happen on November 25th. The entire world, not just America, the entire world knows that George Floyd was killed on May 25th. Right. Um, so I, I, I think that you're absolutely right. And uh, for me as a journalist, it goes back to the importance of narrative, you know, and, and I keep trying to uh, build a broader awareness about the power mainstream media has mm -hmm. because they're really... Uh, the first line of defense to archive a lot of stories. Right. And so we give them a lot of power. We give mainstream media a lot of power to archive our stories. When uh, a good case of this was the James Baldwin interview that ABC did in 1979 and they never actually aired it. Mm. So we, we give them our stories. They're, they're following this trial. Who else independently, especially in our community, in the black community, is archiving these stories, these facts right. to have an independent account? Um, because if we leave it up to them, history will repeat itself and they will mm. do what they did. The same thing they did with slavery, the same thing that they did with lynchings, you know, right. and George Floyd, uh, we just had an attorney say this was a modern day lynching, yeah. you know, and for a lot of the lynchings, they, they try to cover it up. Uh, they try to justify it. They make it more palatable, all of those things. So I think that you're right. And, um, you know, in, in, Covering this case, there there was a piece of, of information that I actually wanted to run by uh, Dr. Mack. Um, we here in Minneapolis, I'm headquartered in Minneapolis right now. And since George Floyd was killed on May 25th, 2020, the intersection where uh, he was murdered has been shut down. And there were a group of organizers who came together, created 24 demands, and they have preserved that space. They've put barricades up. Uh, m recently, June 3rd, I think was the day, the city came in, removed the barricades. The barricades were put back up. June 15th, they came back in. So there's been this tug of war more recently, but we're looking at now over... 390 days that there has been this ongoing protest in that space. And so it, it brought me to this question of what is the longest protest in American history? And I don't know if you know that off top, but uh, the one a lot of people pointed to was the bus boycott, which I think was 381 days. Mm -hmm. And the question now being, is the protest at George Floyd Square, the intersection where he is killed, the longest protest in American history. Well, you know, again, <clears throat> based on how we define protest today in this kind of knee jerk reaction to an event, one could look at the Montgomery bus boycott, as you stated, for 381 days. One could look at this. Well, I would tell you what America didn't want to recognize. And, and so if I think about it in a, in a critical way, I would say this, the day that they started enslaving black folks, that protest mm. built from, from that day. And even when you look in the uh, the vice president of the Confederacy, it was a man named Alexander Stevens. He wrote this speech called the Cornerstone Speech. And he starts off by saying the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution, the agitating questions, the agitating questions. I promise you this agitation about us being free started from the day we were enslaved mm. in this country. So if you look at and again, most people want to think, 
we sat on the sideline and didn't do anything. Like, for instance, you know, Joe, Joe Brown, the former judge. I mean, he's, the dude's an idiot. And, and I'm all of an idiot because I'm not going to spare him. You know, he wants to. T- he literally said Juneteenth is, is black folks taking an L. I took his gavel and told him he's turned this into a kangaroo court. And I took his black card. So <laughs> because, because, again, he's obviously not aware or, or want to recognize our history. So so this protest has been going for a while. But mm. to your point, I, I do recognize, you know, the question that you're putting in and, you know, outside of the Montgomery bus boycott and that length of time, I would say this, but, but what is clear is that the George Floyd protest is by far the large, I mean, the largest protest in the history of this country. This protest involved well over 25 million people. Wow. There is not a protest that I know of in this nation that even came close to that. I literally thought Rodney King was, you know, at the time, I thought Rodney King was the largest protest, if you will. And even before that, you go to the 1963 March on Washington. When we marched on Washington, there was somewhere between 200. You know, if you put a large spectrum to it, 250, 300,000 people that, that came to that protest, 25 million, mm. you know, mm. in every state in the union, all over the world, yeah. nothing even yeah. close to the reaction that the death of George, the murder of George Floyd caused from a protest standpoint in this country. Mm. We're discussing critical race theory and the Derek Chauvin sentencing that just took place over the weekend. But we're also talking about Juneteenth and the history, the accurate history and the necessity for history to be told accurately and and archived. Uh, Georgia, I appreciate the way you framed it, um, because that's what's happening with the media. They are the official archivers. And if they are archiving it through their lens, then we our future is doomed to be the interpretation of um, of people who don't look like us and, and, and don't have the same fights and struggles as us. Um, and, and that includes a conversation on Juneteenth. That Marjorie Taylor Greene is not. And she actually is coming into a moment where I think that she's, you know, apologetic about a couple of things that she said what? about. a Yeah, I'm shocked, too, about a couple of conspiracy theories that she's thrown out there. Um, I guess she visited the Holocaust Museum uh, recently. And for the things that she said, like the conspiracy theories that she's tied to with the disrespect that she's tied to uh, the people who went through the Holocaust, she now has an apology. She has a change of heart. Let's take a look at what she said. I want to remind everyone, I'm very much a normal person. And I think it's important for me to always be transparent and and honest. And I just want to tell you all, I'm I'm really, really lucky. Uh, I was blessed with, I am blessed with amazing parents. And my dad just passed away in April. But I will say he taught me some great things. And one of the best lessons that my father always taught me was when you make a mistake, you should own it. And I have made a mistake and it's really bothered me for a couple of weeks now. And so I definitely want to own it. This afternoon, I visited the Holocaust Museum. The Holocaust is, there's nothing comparable to it. It's, it's, it happened and, you know, over six million Jewish people were yeah, she got the facts. More than that, there were not just Jewish people, black people, Christians, all kinds of people, children, people that, that the Nazis didn't believe were good enough or perfect enough. And the horrors of the Holocaust are something that some people don't even believe it happened. And some people deny, but there is no comparison. <laughs> and there are words that I have said, remarks that I've made, 
that I know are offensive, and for that I want to apologize. <laughs> and I am, I am just fine and very glad to be able to come out here and do that. Because I believe oh boy! Important. I believe that if we're going to lead, we need to be able to lead in a way where if we've messed up, it's very important for us to say we're sorry. And I, I love the very beginning of this. Rebecca, where she's like, actually, just play it again. Just the first few first yeah. sentence. We're in the first sentence again, David. I want to remind everyone, I'm very much a normal person. I'm very much a normal person. I think it's <laughs> so if, if you've got to start your speech like you that, know you, you know you you're crazy. not a normal person. <laughs> you know you're, you know you're a terrible person at that, you know, because that's the she's a narcissist. Um, and right. those are the type of people who uh, will do something terrible just mess up everything and then turn around and give their self credit um, mm -hmm. and, and, and label themselves as something that they are not. And she will never hold herself accountable. This was in the moment where the narcissists do this too. They'll utilize words and they'll try to uh, take the empathy. And, but what they do, they're not placing it on you and how they've hurt you. It's she's placing it on herself and saying, now that I've seen the light, mm -hmm. I deserve I deserve, I deserve for to everyone to, yes, to forgive me for the past uh, things that I've said, my past transgressions. And this is literally, she'll see, her apology um, is literally for her repeatedly comparing coronavirus precautions to the oppression of Jews by mm. Nazi Germany last month, declaring that she's removing those comparisons. That's what she said. I'm going to remove those comparisons. Basically, I'm going to take back what I said um, of the mask mandates. And this is something that I believe uh, goes hand in hand with her conspiracy theories, right? She had those up on, on site, right? And she had a lot to do with a lot of people not wearing masks. A lot of her people not wearing masks. They would cite her as an example and use her example as well, saying that they feel like they are, uh, you know, Jews are part of the Holocaust and the leader is like Hitler. Mm. And this is all for wearing masks. They felt like, you know, to say that about a whole nation of people who were forced, who were their, their lives were taken, who were in gas chambers, who were in camps, just because to wear a mask to save your life and the lives of the people around you. The disrespect, yeah. the utter disrespect. And then this is the same woman that made her comments uh, when it came to uh, the terrorist, the domestic terrorist, the white domestic terrorist here. And for gun, for her supporting the gun laws and things like that. Her, the conspiracy theories that she put with the uh, the Sandy Hook and all those things uh, that she put out there. Oh, don't forget the Jewish this, lasers, the, the lasers from space. Right. The wild this, is, this is the same woman. This is the same woman who uh, has some issue, an issue with LGBTQIA plus community and literally was taunting her uh, her coworker across the way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so this is the same woman. But she's telling you, forgive me for what I said. Not let me come and let me really. I, I'm sorry because I hurt you guys. I hurt a nation of people. No, forgive me for what I said. And let's move on from it. And, I and remember, I'm a normal person. And, and I'm a normal person. And, and my bad. dad just died back in April. I'm so mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. So sorry for your loss. I too, I too have feelings. Yes. I too mm -hmm. can be cut and bleed the same blood as you. Right. We I are just, one. She she's trying her new. She's trying the opposite side of the Karen card. The front hand side of the Karen card is the fact that they'll call the police on you. They'll call you some Jewish space lasers and, and wearing a mask is Nazi Germany. That's that's Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. That's the front side of her. On the flip side are the white tears. Oh, guys, I'm such a normal soccer you know mom. It. There My dad died in April and, mm -hmm. and, and he taught me a wonderful lesson that when you're wrong, you can admit it. And I, all of a sudden, I have black friends and, and the lower third, the lower third is killing me here. Marjorie Green <laughs> discovers the Holocaust. All of a sudden, she discovered the Holocaust. She went to the Holocaust Museum and everything's fired down. She's Perfect. forgiven. It's like, perfect. How long ago? Like you're just now. That, that's what it is for me. <laughs> no, but she she thought she knew. Holocaust? She was strong and wrong. She thought she knew. <laughs> strong and, and wrong. He, he, here's here's where it is for me. It was when you know she she thought she knew. She used she cited the Holocaust to uh, give her a, her her argument that masks are uh, causing people not to breathe, causing mm -hmm. people to feel like they're oppressed people. The people who wear masks or forced to wear masks uh, are oppressed people. Mm -hmm. And we need to free them. We need to let our people 
go. And uh, she made sure she cleaned up for this moment, too. And this is where this is where you are. You're giving information that's incorrect and you finally get information. Now you feel one. Feel one with the people who have died Feel one with the people who have lost their lives people, For the people who you've hurt by saying that And because you feel one with them Yeah, because you feel one with them They they need to extend their forgiveness mm. To you mm. Not mm. you Literally apologizing to a community of people And saying that you understand That you were wrong You were at fault And how you want to move forward to help their communities. Mm. Like this is you owe, girl. You owe you or you are you're in position to start pushing for policies to assist those people, to assist people who are marginalized, to understand then for you to you need to open your mouth and say, I was wrong because I also put out a rhetoric that was incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, Having having an opinion about the mask mandate is one thing, but putting out there um, uh, a rhetoric and making it seem like it's Bible mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. a group of people. That's another. And I was wrong for doing so. <laughs> Rebecca, I like what you, how you're framing this. I think the way you're framing it is is actually really important for us to, to understand what Marjorie Taylor Greene is really doing here. Um, and how what she's doing here ain't no different than what Democrats are doing to us. <laughs> Let me stay with me. Um, <laughs> because... Come on, when, Where's when, the organ? Yeah. <laughs> I need, I need, I need the organ. There you go. Somewhere around here, I got a keyboard. But no, for real, Rebecca, you, you, you're, you're distinguishing the difference between someone who has centered themselves in an issue versus centering the victims of the issue, hmm. right? And gaslighters, this is what we do. You said it twi- two or three times, and I clicked. I'm like, oh wait a minute, I know that technique really well. This is what people do is what they do is that they they try to connect with you on some emotional level without actually giving credence to the fact that you were the one that was harmed and that I was the one doing the harming. Marjorie Taylor Greene was the one actively doing the harming. She has centered herself in this conversation to be the one to receive the sympathy instead of showing empathy to the people, instead of actually doing anything for the people she harmed and instead of actually doing anything for us. They love not only Marjorie Taylor Greene, not only the Democrats, just just white America in general. They absolutely love giving us something that is like centers them. The Black Lives Matter flags in the window. It mm. centers them. Yeah. You know, then. <laughs> but when it's time for policies, we can't get the George Floyd bill passed. H.R. One. We can't get voting rights protected. We can't get the filibuster overturned so we can we can't get nothing. But they love putting hmm. them flags up. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow, wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. Hello. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come on, Pastor. You in the house today. Well, you know, you, you, know, you, know, house, you do that one. You know you preach a mm-hmm. <laughs> oh. <I> need... <laughs> yeah. Jesus, Jesus said. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> These Democrats ain't no good. Yeah. Well, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie well, Taylor Greene now, now. Just well. learned about the Holocaust. And what she said, what she said. Holocaust. She said. <laughs> well, <laughs> play around well. and I'll catch a tune for real. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> mm-hmm. She said those space lasers. <laughs> lasers. Well, oh, what space she said. lasers. We're burning up the ground. Oh God! She said that her stinky well, breath, <laughs> stank Lord, well, in the mask uh, is like the oppression by Nazi Germany. We should brush your teeth. Oh, and <laughs> Jesus! You in the house today, Pastor Marjorie Taylor Greene was wrong. She will be wrong. She was strong and wrong. She's still on the wrong side of the wrong, oh, and man. that is just what it is. Marjorie Taylor Greene does not does not stand the chance uh, and I don't forgive her. Next case! <laughs> Next car ye. Yeah. Look, I'm in line with the stars. I'm in sync with the earth. Ten toes deep, flower child from the turf. I never switch sides. Like, even when I die, I'm a ride for the squad. Let her ties in the hearse. I've been on a vibe kind of hard to describe. I'm in between. I'm good and it's fine, but I'm tired of the grind. Then I come alive in the night to realize I'm in the middle of the time of my life. It is my, 
esteemed pleasure to bring to Like It or Not uh, none other than the indomitable Anthea Butler, Professor Anthea Butler. She's an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Graduate Chair in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Butler also serves as the President-Elect of the American Society for Church History and is a member of the American Academy of Religion, American Historical Associates, Association, and the International Communications Associations. Professor Butler has a new book coming in the spring entitled White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Professor Butler, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm good, Ben. How are you doing? I, I'm doing amazing. Dwayne, make sure you feed her sound into my ears. Um, thank you for joining us. I, I want to start. There's so many things that I like to discuss with you whenever you come on because um, because of my background coming from the black church. But I want to start with the abomination uh, that we saw this weekend at CPAC. Um, and I believe we have some footage of it. Uh, Dwayne, roll the footage of the golden calf, the golden idolatrous image of Donald Trump that was wheeled out to the Congress, the, the, the conservative political action committee co event this weekend. Um, well, while we wait on that footage, Professor, what was your first take um, when you saw that? What came to mind when you saw the level of idol worship that is now happening in evangelical circles? This was the tackiest TBN crap I've ever seen in my entire life. Okay, I mean, like, let's think about this for a minute. This, this He had on boxer shorts and flip-flops, okay? This is like the fatted golden calf, okay? It was like a combination between Bob's big boy and some, like, cheap tawdry toy, except I heard it was made in Mexico, so it, maybe this was Mexico's way of saying, thanks for building that wall. Let's send the ugliest possible statue we can of you. But the fact that they were worshiping it just lets you know everything about evangelicals right now. They are messed <laughs> up. They are really, really, really messed up. I mean, it's ugly. Okay, ugly. <laughs> are you talking about? Are you, I'm sure you're talking about both. But are you talking about the uh, image, yes. the golden <laughs> image being ugly, or the idea that we have an entire movement of of so-called Christians? literally doing the exact opposite of what we you should not making for yourself a golden image and here they are exactly. they literally that like all of it is 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 disgusting and ugly but they're serious about it like people lined up and took pictures with it like what does that say in terms of the depth and the breadth of the of the religious derangement that they tied into this this conservative movement and just let you know, it's not about Jesus. It's, I mean, this is what the whole topic of my new book is about. This is not about morality. This is not about being nice. This is about wielding power. And if they can wield power using a cheap golden statue, they will do it. OK. And the fact that people lined up to take pictures with this ugly thing and will be placing them up on their Facebook pages, their Twitter feeds, their Instagram and everything else. Let you know two things. Number one, Donald Trump is in their heads so hard that it's ridiculous. And two, that they don't even see their own abomination. Basically, when you mm. said the abomination of desolation, that's scripture, okay? <laughs> and this is the abomination of desolation, that they have to worship this very, very ugly statue of their man because he's not in the White House anymore. <laughs> I'm so, I, this is why I love bringing you on, because not only do you give us grounding and historical and religious perspective, but you also just don't have any F's left to give. Like you just you don't pull sure any punches. Don't. <laughs> I want I, I want to pivot really quickly to the subject of your book. Your book is coming out um, and I believe it's coming out this month. Am I correct? Oh, child, wait a minute. Let's let's do the Let's do the cartoon thing here. Hello. This is it. It's out and it will be in your mailboxes in about two weeks. OK, awesome. Cool. Oh, thank you. That's that's awesome. Anthony Anthony Butler. Black, OK, white evangelical racism. Like, so the book is out. Tell us about the the kind of the, the, the subject matter. Give us like the title. The title says it all. But like, what would be your thesis if you could like sum it up? Uh, racism is a feature, not a bug in American evangelicalism. It is a feature because it's the history of evangelicalism. It's mm. been there since we started using the word evangelical to talk about this movement in the 19th century. Mm. And what I'm doing is giving you a sweep to let you see all the ways that racism has been in evangelicalism through slavery, Billy Graham, uh, mm. the religious right, the moral majority, George W. Bush, Obama and how they treated him all the way mm. up to Donald Trump. So, you mm. know, when people talk about this as though, oh, evangelicals just fell off the rails because of Donald Trump, 
they didn't. They were already off the rails and they've been off the rails. And we have to stop talking about them as though we think that this is something that just happened in the last four to six years. It's actually mm. been happening for 200 plus years. Mm. Absolutely. I want to bring my my co-host in here, Rebecca Azor, because we all come, all of us come from the church background and evangelicals, evangelicals, like just depending on what part of this, the country you're from. But Rebecca, jump in there. Yeah, listen, uh, and nice to meet you. Great to meet you, Professor Butler. <laughs> um, it's interesting because a lot of people may see you and view you and, you know, as a religious professor and somebody who works in the community and in the church and knows about it. But how do you, especially in times like this, you know, being a black woman, uh, a religious black woman, um, and then ha having the nerve to talk politics, mm. how how has that been for you and how, how have you been successfully been able to tie the two together mm. because it's my work it's my scholarship it's who i am and i don't think about it as being nerve i think about it as being my duty i'm a prophet mm. and i'm coming to tell people about what's wrong and so mm. when you have a prophetic gift and that the gifts of calling to god are without repentance i didn't want to get on here and preach this morning come on, come on but now. i'm gonna go ahead on and, and just say that it doesn't matter because i don't need to stand up in a pulpit to tell somebody the truth I'm yes. telling you the truth right now. And I think that especially for us, uh, African-Americans, and especially for African-American women who are in these churches, and some of them have voted Republican and have voted for Donald Trump. You need to understand this, that mm -hmm. it's time for people to take the wool off of their eyes and see what our history really is. If we don't reckon with this history, this history is going to kill us. It's going to kill mm. this nation. It's going to kill democracy. And until That's we it. get to deal with the original sin of racism, we can't go any further. Mm. Can, can you? Oh, Lord. So we I feel like I, I want to go and get my organ. My ham and organ is in the other room. That was enough, to, that was enough to shout like, right there. <laughs> because cause, yeah. Yeah. Right. Don't wait till the show is over. Shout right now. But anyway, I'm sorry. We go. We go. We go. We're going to contain That's this. Because, plate now. <laughs> Y'all send up them super <laughs> chats. <Super> chat. no. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, uh, in, in the last time we spoke, we talked about um, and, and and you contextualize it for me even more, because my thing that I've been saying for a long time with regard to evangelicals um, has been that at, at, a, at a lot of times in American history, they have literally been the people we have had to fight against in order to get our liberation as black people. That said, in throughout American history, uh, in recent history, right, we have seen where uh, people would um, lynch us on Saturday night and go to church on Sunday morning. Last time you said not only that, you said that they would they would go to church on Sunday morning and then lynch us afterwards. Can you talk about that disconnect in the humanity? Like there's like a, a, a lack of humanity while they're crying Jesus at the same time they are crucifying his children. Yeah, well, I mean, it's basically this. This again comes out of slavery. They didn't think we were human. And so mm. crucifying us, lynching us and doing anything else. I mean, I, I got to correct you that the the top, the piece that I give in the book, they actually lynched the black man before they went to church. Ugh. So you need to understand that it's like it, church don't matter. That It's like, mm. let's do this hanging before we get to church. And then we go go in there and praise God. But it's a mm. white God that they're praising. It's a, it's a God that they think that is actually on their side. And so yeah. I think that one of the things that we have to dissect about this is that there are white people who still don't think that we are human. I have a story in the book that's about, um, you know, I, I think some of us probably remember this it was a couple of years ago. Interracial couple came into a place in Mississippi that asked to get married. They said, we don't do those kind of weddings. here. We it. only do Christian weddings. Right. So they don't even think we're Christian, let alone human. Mm. And, and this is this is part this is part of the issue. And I think there are more people in America that really believe that than than don't. And I think we have to wow. start dealing with that. Wow. And Professor Butler, it's interesting that you said that um, this is a white God that they're believing in. This is, you know, some made up God that they're going by since back in the day. They would, like you said, they would lynch before they went to church, after they went to church. It didn't really matter. Yeah. That's just what they believed yeah. in. And they believe that their God was OK with this happening. It's very interesting because when you say that this white God, it, it's almost like right now how they're praising Donald Trump, this white God. They have made this mm. golden image. And mm -hmm. this man mm -hmm. who has brought racism to the like has highlighted racism as something so good. Right. Allowed mm. white folks to take off their hoods and walk in and and and. and do things like the insurrection. I mm. relate that to the same thing. These people will um, 
use their white God uh, and to say that this is why they're doing what they're doing. Like we had, we have these evangelicals like Paula White who mm. <laughs> say it's okay to do a lot of these things, calling on African angels, child. It's just, it's all wrong. Mm-hmm. It's confusion yeah. and, 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 but this is what they, these are the, the morals that they stand on to yeah. back up and defend the, the things that they do. Like they've been doing for centuries. Right, so. right. Yes, and My- yes, and I think that we need to just understand what that is, what you say is very true. I mean, let me just put it to you as blunt as I possibly can. In the insurrection, they prayed in the Senate chamber, but they also <laughs> put feces all over the Capitol. Mm. So mm. what kind of God is that? <sighs> Some white supremacist barbaric God that they <laughs> all right, came then. out of the Caucasus Mountains with. I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because it really does, because then, then they have taken the last 40, 50, 60 years, um, and actually longer than that, but I'm just thinking like since um, the evangelical movement tied themselves to the conservative movement in response to uh, Roe versus Wade and in response to Jimmy Carter, they've taken these last 40 years and inserted themselves into the national conversation on the side of what they decide or they determine to be quote unquote sexual morality, right? But have mm-hmm. zero regard for economic economic morality, have zero regard for um, uh, the lives that they take with the military industrial complex. Can you talk about the selective morality uh, of religion in general, but specifically this this white evangelicalism that is tied itself to both imperialism and capitalism? Yeah, well, I mean, part of the book is really about this whole trajectory of how they use morality as a shield. What I'm talking about is basically that what they do with these moral issues is hide behind them to do what they need to to do. In other words, let's talk about that. So abortion is one of those moral issues. But the real Mm -hmm. issue behind that was taxes and tax evasion for uh, Bob Jones University that didn't want to integrate, okay? So Mm -hmm. they could say it was abortion on the outside, but it was really about taxes on the inside, okay? So we can think about that. They can say it's about keeping Christians, you know, pure, when the reality is when we get past 9-11, it's all about vilifying Muslims and Islam, right? And mm. and saying that that's okay and it's okay kill to kill, you know, people and to go to war and do all of that. How George Bush justified war is the same thing that they did to say, well, you know, Obama was a Kenyan Muslim, so they could get two for one. He was also, you know, he was an immigrant who was not saved. And then he was also a Muslim. So, you know, that made it two birds, one stone. So all these moral issues that they claim to say are actually just shields for the dirt that they are actually doing for the kinds of things, the warmongering, the capitalism, all of this stuff comes out of we're going to put morality in front of everybody else. Meanwhile, we will forgive Mm -hmm. people like Ted Haggard, who slept with a dude that he met online. Okay, Mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't care who you're sleeping with, but stop trying to tell us that homosexuality is bad when you got dudes that are stepping out on their wives every day in evangelicalism, doing what they need to do and treating their women badly. Mm. Mm. (coughs) We got to let that one breathe for a second. (laughs) Yeah, air it out. Um, (laughs) You're totally right. And that just goes behind and towards the whole the truth of the matter, these people are um, mm. these people are hypocrites and they expect only their law or when they do wrong to be covered because they're white, right. they're white, they're white supremacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, you know, they believe that when they already look at us in, as inferior to this day, like you said, pe- they still look at us as inferior as if God will not or the God that anybody serves will not hear our cry because we're just inferior. Um, but one thing about it is just I'm glad that we have voices like yours because yeah. to attack in these in these areas in, in 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 the schools at the church wherever because these people and i'm glad that we can speak on on this right now because even if it's not christianity like you said it's the muslims they will choose the um who to to attack and mm-hmm. and berate mm-hmm. but when it's to their own people who are who may be homosexual the things that they are so against who are getting yeah. abortions um uh, and i'm pretty sure there's i know that ben you talked about this a few times it's the church folks who be getting them abortions and things yes. like that so yeah. you know those those things they will cover it up figure it out but let let it be the others they (laughs) will drag drag it out my god um but yet there are people who lots of them who are conservative and who go by these conservative this conservative way of life in the background they got their kids their family members them drug abuse all kinds of things so oh absolutely 
the double <laughs> standard. The double standard is 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 something that um, that I saw. And and you know, just in case people are wondering why we're so hard on white evangelicals, because one we should be, but then also this is a level of hypocrisy that that just transcends humanity in general, but especially in religious circles. I have a, a kind of a, a, a I want to shift really quickly with the few minutes that we have here. Um, the other thing about this is. The way that um, evangelicals and religion in general has this very myopic interpretation of the universe, God, all these things in the first place. It's just something that dawned on me a couple couple months ago. And it's like, you know, we're you have all these people who are on these political platforms in these pulpits who are shouting about how great their God is. And the first thing that they do in the evangelical church, in, in a lot of circles of Christianity, is they take this big, humongous entity that they call God, and then they, they limit him, or it, or they, to a gender, first of all, to a, to, a, to a race, second of all, but then also they limit that entity to our human understanding of time. Like, they, they, they're serious about this. They seriously think that the earth is like no more than 6,000 years old and that when it was created, it was created in seven human days as if the 24 hour clock is anything relevant to the broader universe. Could you just talk about like how myopic and how infantile they have to interpret their own religion in order for it to maintain their political goals? Well, you know, this is this is where I'm going to get, get back into the weeds again and go, this is 19th century stuff. This is when Bishop Butcher said, you know, the earth was this many years old and this is how you calculate it. And they're actually relying on some old school 19th century things to make their Bible fit their 21st century worldview, which really is kind of a basic um, not not professional, not thought well, not um, educated worldview. OK, so when we talk about things like creationism and all that, they've got a big old. I don't know if you know this, but there's a big copy of the Ark in Kentucky. Yeah. There's a creation museum for all of that. Inhale. You can go yeah. through the Holy Land and for and Florida. I mean, mm -hmm. they make everything literal. Right. And mm -hmm. these literal ways of interpreting the Bible, we already know that are not correct. OK, and there's plenty of biblical scholars who have faith who would sit down and talk to you about all of that. But for evangelicals, the easiest thing to do, and fundamentalists too, is to say the Bible is the literal word of God. It is infallible. It is, you know, you, it, it should be used for everyday life. I mean, if that's the case, then you could cut up your sister if you thought somebody raped her and throw her everywhere if you take the Old Testament at, at its word, right? right? But they don't really even pay, pay attention to all of that stuff. And I think that one of the things we have to understand is that you can put this on a spectrum, whether we're talking about fundamentalists in Islam or fundamentalists in Judaism or fundamentalists in Christianity. They all have similar aspects to them. They all think about their scripture as being this kind of literal text that they have to live off of. It makes them not see anything about science. We could go into the whole COVID thing and talk about how many church people have died because they still feel like they need to go to church. And there's COVID. Right. And, and they don't understand science and they don't care about science. And they think God is going to protect them because God is this little thing that they can manipulate. And then right. the next thing you know, they are burying folks and they're replicating the same thing at the funerals because everybody is gathering around a coffin. Right. Mm. And so they spread the Rona everywhere. So these are the ways in which this is really hurting us right now and hurting the people around us. Everybody's got somebody in their family. I do, too, who, you know, thinks that God is going to save them from everything. And I'm like. Yeah. That's not quite how it works. Mm -hmm. And you think that God is involved in these little pieces of your life when if God is everything and if God is running the universe and made the universe and all this stuff, then maybe you should think about the fact that you have to exercise some common sense in your everyday life <laughs> and think about what you're doing instead of running around here without a mask thinking that God's going to save you from stuff. Right, right. God can't save you from your own stupidity. Right. Exactly. God, he can't stay from your intentional obtuseness. And this is, is this is what mm -hmm. we're drenched in. And I think it's so pertinent. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of my supporters are not believers and and they they understand the importance of these conversations, however, because of the impact that religion has in American politics on a level that that just cannot be ignored. And so your work and your your research, as well as your upcoming book, is a critical one. Uh, Professor Anthea Butler, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And the newest book, before I let you go, the new, your latest book that is out, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Please pick up that book. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. 
Thanks for having Thank me. You. It's my time to ride and I'm young, I'm free, can't nobody take me here and now, it's my time to ride it out, it's my time, it's my time, it's my time to so, ride it out. Why do you uh, sound like a black man? No, you sound like right. a, it's everybody else who did things much worse are already home, okay? <laughs> Billy Bob and them are home. I've been here for a month, and they're going to send for home. another month. Everybody Everything's the devil to you, yeah. mama. <laughs> they're home. Everything's the they're devil home. to I got, you. I got, I got a whole farm out there with horses, and who's tending to my horses? <laughs> There's nobody tending to my farm. What the hell you mean you know, I can't get out of jail? <laughs> this is some Black Lives Matter stuff. They're behind all of this and the whole reason and why I'm Tim here, Ball. Billy Bob. Do you hear me? Do you hear me, Mary, Mary Sue? Do you hear this? The whole reason why I'm here <laughs> is because you know what? Christ on the cross. I don't <laughs> want to be in here. <laughs> I'm it took me out. Got me in here with these colors. <laughs> <laughs> these colors. <laughs> They're touching me. They're looking at me. They're waiting for me to get out there to go get my lunch. Can't even eat my lunch in peace. Yeah. Some big black guy said he's going to take me in the shower. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> now they're trying to brand me with the swastika. I don't even want to be anything like that, but I don't want to be with the swastika. <laughs> I just swastika. <laughs> I can't oh breathe. man, oh, Christ on the cross. That did it for me. I'm done. Oh, that did it for me um, too, man. <laughs> hey, it's 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 Cliff Reddy. <laughs> we gonna get we gonna get canceled. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you gotta walk, say yeah. yeah. Everybody's going somewhere. Yeah. Young or old, I really don't care. Yeah. Life has never really been fair. Yeah. So put your fist up in the air. Yeah. Say yeah. So we can talk about our evangelical friends a little more. Let me see if I can put some of this together. I heard the United States Navy is about to enter the prophetic scheme. Watch for this. I heard the Pentagon say, whoa. I saw the Oval Office dark. <laughs> oh, the man on the keys. I heard this. Everything is wide open right now. And I heard... Oh, no, it ain't good, then. I heard... What is this? Impeachment. I heard impeachment. And I heard resign. Impeachment. Is that a wig? Oh, Robin Bullock. Okay. <laughs> That's what I heard. I'm going to tell you something. He's talking about Joe Biden. I know. <laughs> this. He, it's Joe not Biden getting... <laughs> is still not the president. He's never been the president. He's still not the president. And he never will be the president. Mm, there you go. So therefore, everything within this so-called. <laughs> the music is killing me, man. Man, you need to be on the keys. Staff. <laughs> Their administration, their so-called administration, is bogus. And he's bogus. off key. The guy is not playing either. And I with heard them. impeachment and resign. It's supposed to be. <laughs> I don't know what's worse, the music or the conspiracy theory. Or the wig, man. It was giving. You mean that wasn't his real hair? That wasn't his real hair? Ben, and no, I, I didn't see a part <laughs> that was giving. No, that was giving wig. He definitely, that's a wig. Oh, and man. It, it, and the color that he's doing is ba it's a 1B out the box. It's oh. not, it's it, no. Secondly, the whole thing, the whole thing was a, a disappointment, Ben. I'm like, <laughs> it was, it, you couldn't even. It, he didn't hear anything. That's why he kept saying, I heard. <laughs> I heard. I what? heard. 
<laughs> and he didn't hear nothing. See, that's the thing. He was asking God to, he, he was asking God to give him something. And the Lord didn't give him a thing. Let me tell you something. Has he not learned from an uh, old girl? I keep forgetting her name because the Lord doesn't want me to remember. But uh, Paula not, White supremacist. Has, has he not learned from Paula White supremacist? Okay, because right now he's and, and he's not, not giving, call on no African angels. No, don't call on no African angels and don't ask God to give you to give you a sound from the earth. <laughs> you deaf, so, right? That's all you hear. That's why because then and that's why they quiet because you're supposed to be like, Come on, Pastor, you better say that. All right. Oh, you in the man. house today, Pastor, but it was then and then. <laughs> That's about as good as I. That's, that's about as good as I play. That's then no, it would have been. <laughs> and then the, the man on the bass would have been blah, 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 blah. like it would have been something. Okay, <laughs> it would have been a sound in the earth, but this right here. <laughs> And then, and then, because I need to ask. This is Pastor, uh, our self-proclaimed prophet, Prophet Robin Bullock, <laughs> and I need to ask him if, if, at the end, you're declaring that he's not president, he'll never be president, he never was president. Then how the hell can he Im be impeached <laughs> or resign? How do you resign for something you're not? Listen, just, Laura yeah. Estrada said it perfectly. Right? Mm. She said, "Billy Ray Jesus." <laughs> <laughs> Billy Ray Jesus. Billy Ray Jesus has it wrong. Billy oh, Ray Jesus man. is out here. Exactly what we were talking about, Ben, and how we definitely had um, you know, me telling <sighs> my stories to lead into this this clip. It is perfect. It's a it's a perfect example of what we've been talking about. Billy Ray Jesus is feeding <laughs> his his flock lies. He's starving them with the lies. There's nothing being fed there. I love my mom be like, are you being fed at the church? She always asked me if you're because not everybody's going to be fed the same way. Mm. She always asked me to say, are you being fed there? Because if you're not, you got to find something else. Mm. If you are not being fed, what's the point of you sitting there is you're going to you're going to be empty. So those people are thinking they're being fed, but they are empty and they're taking all of this and going home. So good. 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 And I don't like that. I don't like that. See, but, but oh. and then I, I I really don't like the disrespect that the men on the keys was doing. <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> Rebecca, leave the man on the keys. I, I don't like that at all. Beep, Somebody, beep, beep, no, beep, no, no, no. But watch this. Watch what they do though. While they got um, because you know when 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 black folks talk about politics in church, we get attacked like Jeremiah Wright. Right. And yeah. so, you know, you go to these big black churches and most of the time they're not going to be talking about anything political at all. They're going to be talking about, you know, you know, money cometh to me and all that. And, and so Jeremiah what's happening Wright was Obama's um, Obama's pastor. pastor. Right. Uh, former pastor till Obama flipped on him. But that's a whole nother conversation. But the thing is, it's like while Billy Ray Jesus Lauren Estrada, that's such a great, we're going to for, forever call them uh, these pastors who use a pulpit for the Republican Party. Um, Y'all are Ray Billy Jesus. Ray Jesus from now Billy on. Billy Ray Jesus, that's definitely, yeah. Billy Ray Jesus. And we got to get something with Joel Osteen in there because this is there's a whole other type of, because because there's those those preachers who aren't using. And do this all day. Yeah, 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 and they smile. Like, oh the God, Lord is gonna. Uh, bless oh God, we love today. you, and we. God is the just Lord gonna make your day so it's great. Just, no, Joel Osteen doesn't shut his mouth. He's doing this all day. The <laughs> Lord is gonna bless you today. Meanwhile, he didn't. Day. He those people in his uh, his church during that storm. Hmm. Right, remember the hurricane? But, but then he, he came back and did something else after the next. You know, during the um the recent but, storm. Right. But, but we, you, we you were you like you were fifty dozen million dollars. I know I messed up, but come on in. I know I got a lot of land, and you guys may be poor here in Texas, but if you let me be your leader, okay, your spiritual <laughs> guidance, and give me um, every last dollar you got. 
So what's the name, audience? What is the name of that? It, you know, it's, it's got to be something because Billy Ray Jesus is just is perfect to describe how evangelical baby face Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so for IKEA, we were, and it's funny we were thinking about okay, next year we're gonna have all these Juneteenth ads like Sunday, <laughs> come get your mattress sale, Juneteenth sale on mattresses. You know it's gonna come up, but no, IKEA took it a step further, and this past Saturday, what they decided to do to honor Juneteenth was to change their menu at their restaurant. Nah. The menu, what were they serving it, on that good old Juneteenth menu? On that menu? good old Juneteenth no. menu. Talk no. about it. Ben, are you ready, brother? No, I'm not. Let me see. Prepare wait, wait. Him. Okay, okay. No, prepare I can't. The, uh, prepare the no table custom. before him. For, prepare the Juneteenth table before Jesus, Let me lay the hold table my, out for hold you, my please. tongue, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> brother, prepare the Juneteenth table before no, him. No, On that it's table, right, brother it's, Ben, it's you had fried chicken. <laughs> Watermelon, <laughs> sweet tea. Was it oh, mac and cheese? Yeah. Potato salad yeah. with the toe on the end of it. Collard greens, colored <laughs> greens, <laughs> and candied yams. <laughs> okay, listen. Nice. And cornbread. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Two <laughs> things. You name it. <laughs> Two things gonna happen here, folks. One. <laughs> I'm going to whip somebody's ass. <laughs> Two, I'm going to take me a plate to go. <laughs> but somebody said, man, y'all tripping. Let so me go be get my plate. This is, this is exactly what I was doing. I said, should I have pulled up to the Ikea? Right. I'm, mad. I'm mad. But should I have pulled up to the Ikea to up. get me a plate? We're going to pull up and beat the ass and pull up and get that plate. Like, you should not have added that damn watermelon. And then give me my, give me my, give my drink. Give, 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 give my <laughs> What my can check so that? That is terrible. <laughs> like it's giving slavery, but we know the food. We know the food. If it's cooked by a black person, they done got it catered by the black business. It might be good, but I'm mad that you guys I'm showed mad. To, 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 to definitely give us watermelon. Oh to my give God. Us fried chicken. And here's my thing about that, too, guys. Why does Juneteenth have to be celebrated with these foods? And I get it, soul food. But the thing is, if you guys watch that documentary that I sent y'all to go watch, High on the Hog, y'all would know yes. that those weren't the only foods that mm. Black Americans were like, were. I dig it. Ate or made popular because we had a, a, a expensive palate, too. Right, mm -hmm. we definitely did. We created in New York. What what was yeah. it? The scallops or whatever it was. Well, lobster, lobster used to be a working class thing, so you know they they threw that to the poor black folks too. Listen, no, but but a lot of this these foods that people <laughs> are rich now and da, da 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 were actually foods that black folks ate. And made popular and ate yeah, all yeah. the time. So our, our palates aren't just soul food, which is great, but soul food actually expands into other things, right? Yeah, that, exactly. That it's like now all of a sudden their restaurants. Let me bring Hello. a little let me, let me bring a little closer home. It's like now all of a sudden they like dark meat. All of a sudden, y'all want to eat dark meat and raise the price. I love dark meat. I can't meat. eat nothing but I dark meat. I'm right. I've been, in Bruh, that sense, <laughs> I, be, I, I, I've been hating white meat. meat. <laughs> I've been hating white meat since I was young enough to even know what the hell piece of chicken was. <laughs> I never hey. knew either. When I had that white meat, <laughs> I'm that dress. I'm a, uh, um, oh my I god! And I and I've never like we don't we eat all kinds of meat. So when we have white meat, we know that's probably like maybe a different part of the animal. That's what we'd be like. This is a different part of the animal. But when we had the dark meat, we knew we could chew it. We knew that it was easy to eat. We knew we wouldn't be chewing for days. So <laughs> dark meat is just and the like, dark hey. meat captures seasoning a little different. Let's talk about it. The dark meat captures that seasoning a little different. It'd be that part of the meat that is seasoned so much. Juicy. Da -da 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 -da. I mean, it's no. like, uh, uh, Look, why y'all go? And now y'all want to come colonize the dark meat? What the hell, white people? Right. Hey, real quick, that guy us five oh four. If their furniture is that hard to put together, imagine how their mac and cheese is. <laughs> you know, it's Dog seven nine seven nine said the only thing missing is the reparation grape soda. <laughs> and y'all know what can it come in too? Y'all know, yeah, like you. Haitians love this particular soda. <laughs> Um, we make Jupina, and then there's this other, there's this other, this other can. It's green, and it has a little girl on there with freckles with watermelon, oh, and it just oh, gives man. me racism. But when oh, I think the soda was so good for us at the church with with um pat, with pate, 
Haitian patties. <laughs> oh. we, were, we were chugging it down, but every time I drink it, I said something is up with this can. I don't know why I don't feel connected to the the image on this can, but the damn drink was so good. It was so good. <laughs> oh my gosh, I hate y'all. Listen, I show sure gonna need a disclaimer, man. <laughs> <laughs> Wear some damn pull ups. Fried <laughs> chicken, watermelon, <laughs> potato salad. Yeah, the, green the, green the, green the, green the green e on the here's the problem, y'all. They probably listened to Wait that a minute. song Wait and they were minute. like, check, 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 check. We oh, know what black people like. Yo, oh, that was the lying. other part of this. All right, go for it. Oh, I was about to say, uh, so when they had the committee that met about this to talk about the menu and see what they were going to do, there was no people of there were no people of color on the board at all. <laughs> Wait a okay. minute. Yeah. Wait, so no white people of color on the board. This menu? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is right now. We're gonna, we gonna pull up for her. We're gonna pull up for her. I don't want none of your janky ass mac and cheese. We know, okay, <laughs> but now I can't say that they're not flavoring because there are some white people that flavor it with you know the minimal, and that's you know the salt, the pepper. Um, some okay, of them so, are okay, using if, keep it, if I was gonna say, if I'm keeping 100, sometimes that food at Ikea be popping. Some one of the meatballs there, that they have the meatballs. They be working. Money if you're shopping at Ikea. Huh? Oh, Ikea is supposed to be because I, I remember when I first moved here thinking, oh gosh, after moving from after moving from New York, I said if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Remember, you guys know my story about that. When I moved here, I was like, oh, like everybody seems to be so uppity, <laughs> and I'm uppity. So no, imagine like the uppity level here of black. So I'm like, Rebecca's the poor rich black girl. <laughs> that's me. And I, I was like, let me go to Ikea and get something. Went to Ikea. <clears throat> I said, I can't afford nothing in Ikea. <laughs> I can't afford nothing. After walking around for 30 minutes, 30 minutes to about 40 minutes, oh I walked over. How are y'all not patrons yet? Go I ahead. I took my $60 and walked over because I thought I was going to get something at Ikea for $60. I walked over with my $60 and spurred 20 bucks in their food area. And I sat down <laughs> and watched everybody else shop. And I people watched as if I was in New York. And I felt like if I was I was somewhere comfortable for, for once at the moment. Because I said, I ain't got nobody's money. I'm working for this company that's paying me about $350 every two weeks. And I ain't got, I don't have it. I just moved here yesterday and I have no furniture. So you know what I did? I went to the thrift store and I makeshift a lot of furniture. And then it came out really nice. Yeah. But anywho, yeah. Well, yeah, we know how to do that now for sure. Yeah, but now I'm I'm shopping at the big name brand places. Thank God for Jesus. Like IKEA uh, with corporate money. <laughs> <laughs> IKEA, no, I skipped over IKEA. I'm at American Signature. Oh, oh, girl, listen, you balling hey, in? Damn. Listen, listen, don't I'm let don't, listen. <laughs> my, 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 my wife. <laughs> My wife is sitting in the background saying, I know Ben ain't out, out here stunting because we had, we'd be at the thrift store too. So no, don't, don't, thrift, don't store right. my, it, it, thrift store literally got me through when I first moved into this apartment too, because um, there were a lot of, there were just a lot of places that were closed. I couldn't get anything. So I was going to the thrift store. I bought my first TV stand, not this one, but the, um, my first TV stand in here for, um, it was on sale for $5. Um, it was missing a whole row. But what I did was put a big plant in the middle yeah. Uh, and make and then, it work, and you know those were the TVs for the those were the TV stands for the TVs with the big booty in the back. But I didn't have the big booty in the back, so I did that top row with a lot a lot of uh, a lot of different like little things that I got from the Dollar Tree. You got to create a sale. You got to be balling on a budget. You, listen, you hear I know me? We, ball we, on a budget because that is that is the way to live. I don't play that. I ball on a budget. Can you do? <laughs> What is the British Rebecca? Well, we need a British Rebecca. We do not, but it, Rebecca. the British Rebecca would not even. <laughs> my name wouldn't even be. Our names together wouldn't be Rebecca. It would be something rich, you know. Like, yeah, uh, it was like uh, Prince Bubba the Third or something, yeah. and Princess queen, Rebecca Azor the twenty second. Azor yeah. the Queen of queen. Dutch style. <laughs> I would, I would, I'd announce you guys, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, and non-gender conforming individuals. <laughs> Dad, you sound like a teacher from like the early, <laughs> the early like 40s or some stuff. You sound like a teacher from Hogwarts. <laughs> yeah, that's what The force exactly now. <laughs> King James <laughs> and okay. Lady Azor. 
in a uh anyway let's let's i want to i want to talk about one story real quick before we move to our conversation uh with uh professor carl hart um and it is the story out of new jersey i think it's fascinating uh new jersey new jersey has effectively legalized recreational marijuana on monday following voters approval of marijuana legislation in the november general election though medicinal marijuana is already legal and for sale in new jersey it's still going to take months to work out through all the regulations and licensing before recreational sales can begin. Even with that weight, many are hopeful that the passage of the bill will immediately begin to reduce the number of people, mostly people of color, black mm. people, who will be charged with marijuana related mm. crimes and processed through this injustice system. Um, and I want to read a quote from it. It says um, from Governor Murphy in a statement on Monday, and this is what they said. Our current marijuana prohibition laws have failed every test of social justice, mm -hmm. maintaining a status quo that allows tens of thousands, disproportionately people of color, to be arrested in New Jersey each year for low level drug offenses is unjust and indefensible. Um, Amal Sinha, the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey, responded to the passage of the bill with a statement saying, quote, with Governor Murphy's signature, the decades long practice of racist marijuana enforcement will begin to recede. Our state's cannabis laws can set a new standard for what justice can look like. Operative word is can. Joining us now is Dr. Carl Hart. He was a neuroscientist and professor of neuroscience and psychology at Columbia University. He is the author of the recent book, Drug Use for Grownups, which he has de described, quote, I wrote this book to present a more realistic image of the typical drug user, a responsible professional who happens to use drugs in his pursuit of happiness. Dr. Hart, thank you so much for joining this morning. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm good, man. Good, good. I, you know, my first encounter with your work was this summer um, and you wrote a, a, an op ed for The New York Times that we discussed. I had a chance to interview you on on. Uh, we know how George Floyd died. It wasn't because of drugs. And I want to frame this entire conversation in that context, because it is uh, you started exploring and explaining rather um, to us the long legacy of racism in drug use, drug policy and how it affects black people in particular. Could you just frame that conversation from the perspective of how even still to this day they are trying to convince or trying to spin this narrative that if George Floyd had not been on X drug, he would not have died, even though we look at the video and our eyes show us why he died was because of the police state. Yeah, so we have a long history of using drugs as a scapegoat in order to let police get off with police brutality. I mean, this goes all the way back from the 1900, early 1900s, 1800s until this day. I mean, George Floyd uh, had some drugs in his systems. Uh, I think he had um, uh, fentanyl, methamphetamine, and marijuana in his system, um, which really doesn't matter when we saw what we saw. Um, uh, uh, we can think about not long ago, this kid in Chicago, La Laquan McDonald, had PCP in the system. They shot this kid 16 times. Um, and then they said that the PCP made him do it. But then we saw the videotape and we see that the kid was retreating. But um, uh, had not there was a videotape, they, the cop would have gotten off. Uh, and so drugs are used as a scapegoat in order to allow cops to get away with uh unthinkable acts such as the one yeah. we saw with George Floyd. Um, uh, but we have a long history of using drugs as scapegoat. As I'm trying to help the public to understand that uh, people shouldn't be persecuted based on what they have in their in their blood. I mean, a number of people have marijuana in their system now that the drug is legal for recreational and medical uh, purposes in most of the states. Right. Right. And, and, you know, part of this, what fascinated me uh, was about this, about your work in particular, is because you not only study this in terms of science from a scientific perspective, but also you've been able to connect it to historical baggage of this country, just uh, generation after generation. Right. Changing the rules as it pertains to drug use, because it became a very useful tool to vilify black people uh, and not just black people. Historically, you talk about just different points in history. Could you discuss the historical aspect of the transition from uh, casual drug use in this country by the powerful to vilifying black and brown people and people of color. 
Yeah, so we let's just go back to the framers, uh, the, the founding fathers. If we think about like Thomas Jefferson, for example, Jefferson has written about his use of opioids. He, he loved his opioids, um, <laughs> um, as, particularly as he got older. Um, and he, he's written about this sort of thing. The guy who wrote, wrote the Declaration of Independence and mm-hmm. all of the framers loved their psychoactive substances. Now, when black people started to use substances, cocaine specifically, uh, in the late 1800s or early 1900s, uh, cocaine was illegal in the United States. Cocaine was in Coca-Cola. It was in a number of products. Uh, uh, Coca-Cola, somewhere around 1900 uh, or right before 1900, bottled cocaine, uh, meaning that everybody bottled Coca-Cola, uh, which had cocaine in it, meaning that it was available to everybody. Before that, you had to go to the fountain drinks. You had to go to the fountains in order to get Coca-Cola, and Black people weren't allowed to go to the fountain. So Coca-Cola mm. was not available to Black people, but when, Co- when Coca-Cola bottled it, it now became available to Black people. Shortly thereafter, uh, you started hearing these stories that cocaine made black men rape white women. Cocaine made black men uh, unaffected by, by 32 caliber r- bullets. Uh, yes. Southern police forces moved away from the 32 caliber weapon to the 38 we- weapon because they said that the 32 caliber weapon wouldn't stop the black man. Uh, mm. And that's how the police departments uh, increased their caliber of weapon. By 1914, um, we had banned cocaine nationally and as well as opioids nationally. Opioids, of course, were connected with the Chinese uh, who were also uh, uh, discriminated against. And so our drug policy is steeped in racism. We don't ban drugs because of pharmacology. We ban drugs because of racism. And mm-hmm. in my new book, Drug Use for Grownups, uh, I talk about that sort of thing. I talk about the history. I talk about people like James Baldwin, who uh, in 1986, while uh, everybody else was talking about punishing crack cocaine 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine, James Baldwin was one of the few people who was still standing up saying, wait a second, this law can only affect poor black people, the poor and Mm. black people. And and he was right. And so his thing was we should legalize drugs because uh, the drug laws will only be used against poor and black people. And boy, was he right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. If we I also want to uh, dovetail this conversation because we just got through talking about New Jersey's governor um, uh, legalizing marijuana. And it, it's almost as if um, the 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 path to unwinding this racist legislation and history and baggage, all of our people who are in jail, all of our young black entrepreneurs who had uh, weed businesses in jail. It seems like the path to unravel this is so steep and the hurdles are so steep that we're still talking about trying to legalize marijuana across this country when in fact it is, you know, they're just levels to this thing because drug use and drug sale, I, like we're at the bottom of the tier in terms of drug use in this country, yet we carry the disproportionate burden in the prison systems. Could you talk about the disparate views in terms of drug use? Because I, I'm be honest with you, the boys over in Silicon Valley, they talk about micro dosing mushrooms all the time. The cats over and said, I mean, was it Steve Jobs who said that he would never hire anybody unless they did acid? So like, I mean, and you're talking about cocaine, black folk, we ain't got no cocaine money. Like that's just not in our world. That's not in our purview. We don't have that kind of cash. So there is this, there's this, this two different systems when it comes to uh, drug use, even to this day. And we're still just trying to get our young black men out of jail for selling weed. Could you speak on that? Yeah. Let, let's start with one of the points you raised last, uh, People need to understand that the illegal drug trade is a multi-billion dollar industry. That means that it's not being uh, bolstered up or supported by poor people. Wealthy people are in this game. Don't get it twisted. It's too much money involved. That's one. But when we talk about who's going to jail for drugs, uh, let's just take take marijuana since you were talking about Jersey. Um, uh, Black people are... uh, four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than their counterparts. Uh, When we we think about at the federal level, that's at the state level, at the federal level, uh, uh, Latinos, specific Latinos, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, uh, 
two thirds of the people who are arrested for marijuana are those folks. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you talk about just the general population, prison population, black men make up uh, only about 6% of the general population in the United States, we make up uh, damn near 40% of all of the prisoners. I mean, so when you start looking at those numbers, you start to see that, um, yeah, we have racial discrimination going on. And yeah, um, our war on drugs is, is, is really a jobs program. It's a jobs mm. program that primarily hires uh, white uh, lower skilled guys to be the law enforcement officers. Um, and that, that jobs program is predicated on uh, the incarceration of black and brown bodies. And a number of people are benefiting from this jobs program. Uh, the prisons, of course, uh, the hotels and the restaurants that uh, surround the prisons, other industries that surround the prisons, uh, the politicians, they benefit because all they have to say is that, uh, oh, well, we're going to put more cops on the streets um, and they pretend to have uh, 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 jobs for everyone when in fact th these are relatively low level jobs for uh, uh, relatively unskilled people in our society and these mm -hmm. jobs are, are there to replace the factory jobs that uh, moved away when the companies left the country uh, yeah. when we're talking about Ohio Michigan, West Virginia all of those places where these companies left these uh uh, Rust Belt uh, uh, towns, and uh, they were they were replaced with law enforcement officers and mm -hmm. this jobs programs that's predicated on incarcerating people like me. Mm -hmm. Now I, I followed your work, uh, like I said, since June, and and after you know interviewing you back then, I've I've been following very closely, um, and there the headlines that are out on you now are quite controversial in terms of how they're framed. And I didn't want to frame this segment in the same way that um, all the other headlines frame it, because I think it does a disservice to your body of work from my perspective. But now that people have heard the depth and the substance of you, tell us about your openness about your drug use as a Columbia professor, as a neuroscientist, like it, it is all the headlines are saying this is this this Ivy League professor admits to using drugs. Um, but I don't think that's the whole part of the story. Tell us why this narrative is important for you to be forwarding. Um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, you were generous with the headlines. The headlines didn't say that. The headlines are like, uh, Ivy League professor uses heroin daily and wants everybody else to use heroin. I mean, that's what the he headlines were saying. So, right. like I was saying, I, I wrote this new book, Drug Use for Grownups. And in the book, one of the things that I do is that I call upon uh, professionals, people like me, the, uh, largely white professionals who are middle class, who I know are using drugs. I call upon them to get out of the closet about their drug use so we can change this narrative about who is actually a drug user. People think of some poor down and out minority person uh, who is the person who is using drugs like heroin or just drugs in general. And so um, I, in this, with this new book, I went around the world, uh, five continents, many countries within those continents. Uh, and that's just not the story. And yeah. I have, yeah, I have certainly used heroin. I mean, I haven't used heroin, of course, in the, we, we are all in a, pan, a pandemic. And so uh, <laughs> there's no way to really get any uh, uh, <laughs> illegal drugs. Uh, and so, uh, but if you read the headline, if you read the headlines, you know, it's like I, inj I inject every day. I never injected a drug or anything like that. I was making a point and the point that I'm making, the headlines are demonstrating. I was making the point that uh, we are so ignorant. One cannot even admit to using heroin without being slandered, without being viciously attacked, uh, which is uh, that's this is what happens. But I am one of the most responsible people you ever want to meet. Hell, I got two books coming out this year. I mean, and I have other books. Um, 
And I have more than 100 papers in the scientific literature. I put my record up against anybody's record. Uh, my kids are, are doing outstanding. Uh, and, and so, you know, you, you hear these things. I volunteer in my community. I, I pay my taxes. I do all of these sorts of things. Uh, but, yeah, people are telling me I need treatment. <laughs> this shit is wow. Uh, it's just wow. Uh, and so... And then, I, I won't go in too much, but some, some, some cats, even brothers, you know, nonsense. But I won't go to that. So I'm saying yeah, yeah. this is my this Miami mean shit. Uh, so let me chill with that. Uh, I'll chill with that. I mean, but, but no, I'm laughing. I'm laughing. I want to bring I want to bring my co-host up on the screen, Rebecca. So I'm, I'm laughing because you're like, hell, we in a pandemic. Like, but 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 the reason I wanted to to go into that part of the conversation is exactly what you said, right? The intentional usage of those headlines um, to kind of uh, have an inflammatory to, to get clicks. Let's just be sure the headlines yeah. are to get clicks. But the purpose of your work is to push back against the racist narrative that has a unimaginable effect. Actually, I'm, I'm not unimaginable. It's a measurable, a very measurable impact on the lives of young black men, in particular, people of color in general. And as you make this push, it is just it is it, they have reduced you down to nothing more than an, an Ivy League junkie. Um, so so why then not why? How do you continue your efforts in the light of the way media and even some 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 people who are friendly to your work look at this scenario now that these headlines have been spun over about you? Yeah, the, the major thing that I have to say to people is please read the book. The book is Drug Use for Grownups. It's a book about a it's a book about compassion. It's a book about love. It's a book about taking care of the least among us. Uh, and yet somehow these hack journalists have tried to make me the devil, the enemy. Uh, it reminds me of what Malcolm X said. Michael, Malcolm X said that if you, if you read these newspapers, man, they will have you hating the oppressed and loving yeah. the oppressor. I'd be damned if that ain't true. I mean, that's, that's what this is all about. So please read the book. You read the book, and then you'll see what I'm saying. You'll see who the real enemies are. You'll mm. see um, who are really being taken advantage of in this society. The same mm. old people. Uh, the, the people of color, the poor, the same people are being taken advantage of. Mm. Mm. That is that's, that's powerful. Rebecca, I wanted you to. Get oh, here I am. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Dr. Carl Hart, listening to what you said, honestly, in reading the headlines, um, because that's a lot of what was going around. All of the headlines are in sync. It literally is a Columbia professor um, admits to using heroin every day. Mm. It doesn't talk about the book. It just says that, that that's in your new book. So everybody is assuming this man is a heroin addict, right? Because that's what I'm going to get. When I looked, yeah. when I Googled you, that's exactly what came up across the board. But in hearing, you know, what you're saying and how you're breaking it down, um, you know, your story is important to be told by you. Because yeah. if we leave it into mainstream media, it's definitely going to sound like you're some kind of drug addict. You're a druggie who's irresponsible. Although your book literally is saying drug use, basically for adults, you know, right. how to be responsible for with, with drugs. And talking about, um, you know, if we can make it fundamental, you know, and decriminalize these drugs, yeah. it'll be more powerful in stopping black and brown black folks from going to jail for simple things like that. Um, right. But not simple, but not, not even drug abuse, but, you know, just making sure that we stay out of the um, the prison system and, and for, for these things that white folks been doing. So, um, but yes, I do yes. see it because for me, if you didn't come on the show, <laughs> tell your story, I would have definitely been like, oh, this man out here, a whole professor just telling folks they need to be on drugs, those kind of things. But there's so much more to it. And that's why I always go back to that. Dr. Carl Hart, this show is literally um, a safe space for people to literally tell their stories <laughs> the, the way truth. it's supposed to be told. Yes. So, 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You know, so I want to just say one thing, you know, I, it's really important for people to actually buy the book. Drug use yeah. for grown up. The, the subtitle is where the action is chasing liberty in the land of fear. And I'm trying to help people to understand what that liberty means, what the Declaration of Independence promise to you means. It means you have the right to live your life as you see fit, as long as you're not disrupting anybody else's ability mm -hmm. to do the same. And I'm asking people to read the book so they can really interrogate what this means for them and they can see how they haven't been, the, the, uh, the promise has not been delivered to them. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and in terms of like drug addicts, uh, and, and, you know, that's why I'm here. You know, I'm here to take the arrows for drug addicts because I'm a, a tenured professor. I mean, I, I, I have books. I know how to do this sort of thing. They, they, they don't have my sort of platform. And, and then, so imagine how people who don't have my platform get killed. But that's why I'm here. I'm here to take the bullets for them. Uh, and so we can't, we cannot ridicule them. We cannot besmirch them. We cannot attack them. They are people too. And that, that's exactly yeah. why I wrote the book. Well, let's, I want one last fine detail on this then. The, the disparate treatment in, in, in regards to how we perceive drug use and drug users and quote unquote drug addicts, right? It's prevalent. I mean, you've already mentioned to it. You alluded to the fact that you, you face some of that from our own people, right? From, from black folks, from, from kin folk, yeah. right? But then on the flip side, as a society, we have moved towards this, this period of compassion with regards to, um, uh, opioid, uh, uh, overdosing. And we see now that, 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 that treatment and that shift towards compassion didn't come with the crack ep epidemic it came with the opioid epidemic could you speak on that before we get out of here yeah so i wrote a piece in the new york Times, I, I believe in 2018 about this uh, the opioid treatment uh, uh, black versus white crack and opioids uh, the bottom line is that we did have compassion for crack if you really go back and you look uh, mm. white people went to, went to treatment for crack black people went to jail the same thing is happening now uh, when, mm -hmm. when we look at something like heroin, 80% uh, of the people who are uh, being prosecuted at the federal level are black and brown. Meanwhile, white folks mm -hmm. are going to treatment. It's the same mm -hmm. program. I mean, it, we, mm -hmm. if this is the way we have behaved since the inception of this country. And I write about this in my book from a drug perspective. Um, we can think about my book, for example. I wrote a book called Drug Use for Grownups. Uh, this year it was published. And then a, a couple of years ago, uh, the writer, Michael Pollan, uh, he wrote a book uh, called How to Change Your Mind, talking about him using psychedelic drugs and so forth. No salacious headline, none of that Come shit. On. It's just the best seller. <laughs> That's all it is. I mean, and, and so... I mean, don't get it twisted. I mean, it ain't complicated. It's the same nonsense. Mm, mm. But because it's 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 being um, given, it's they don't like the they don't like the person who's the messenger. Right. So when it's it, when the messenger is black, when the messenger looks like you, because let's be real, um, they're not going to focus on you being a Columbia professor. They're not going right. to focus on no, those I, things. I, I they're gonna be like this. This black man with dreads talking about using drugs, you know, he's a druggie. And yeah. and then the white more man. More than that, looks more than that, a black man who knows what the fuck he's talking about. That's the thing, yes. you know. So uh, okay. uh, and, and and so bring it on, just bring hey. it on. Uh, bring it know, on. I'm, I'm one of the most responsible. I'm one of, one of the most responsible people they will ever meet uh, because yeah. I know the shit's coming. So I'm ready. You know, I work yeah. out every day. I'm ready for this. <laughs> You just, this is man. I, I love I love your energy with regards to this it. because of because of the level of frustration I can imagine. Your the the entirety of your life's work. You've been doing this for twenty five years, right? And the entirety of your life 30, work 30. Thir thirty years, thirty years, 30. and and the, your body of work is being reduced by headlines into something that is dismissive of your body of work. So I can I understand the frustration. I just want to highlight it with one last thing. There's a series on Vice TV where the host of the series experiments with drugs, psychedelic drugs, all kind of drugs. The entire point of the series is to do a lot of what you're saying in terms of the, the perspective of towards, towards drug use and drug users. That said, I haven't heard a single headline about that show. 
the way I've heard headlines about you and me knowing your work, at least for the last six or seven months that I've known of your work, I knew exactly what was going on with those headlines. And I appreciate the fact that you're here taking the blows on behalf of something way bigger. What you're confronting, and I'll let you get the last word, what you're confronting is the systemic issue of yeah. criminalizing drugs as it pertains to black people and brown people while everybody else goes to rehab and gets off or enjoys it passion <laughs> yeah so, or enjoys yeah. it yeah. and then talk about it on shows <laughs> exactly exactly you know like let's just when, when Trayvon Martin was killed uh, uh, yes. they said that he had marijuana in the system that's why he attacked uh George Zimmerman I showed up I wrote uh, an op-ed in the New York Times when uh, uh Sandra Bland uh was killed yeah. uh I showed up they they tried to blame marijuana for that I mean uh when all of these people are killed and they try and blame drugs George Floyd I show up and then you know I, I get these attacks from people who, who look like us and it's like what the fuck is wrong with you people uh, this getting attacked from places like the New York Post who don't give a fuck about black people. And, and, and it's, so it's like, what, what is wrong with you all? Yeah. Um, anyway, if you want to be free, you got to understand that you being you are slaves. And I'm trying to mm. free you, as Harriet Tubman has said. Yeah, mm. yeah. Dr. Carl Hart, professor of neuroscience, Columbia University. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Love Thank you, you Mina, Dr. Me. Carl Hart. Next time you come on, we got to make sure we got that bleep button for you. But <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, it's a family. It's like a fa No, but no, we, we loved sorry. it. I, I really, no, I really, no. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yo, you're fine. We, you're fine. <laughs> I love your passion and I love what you're doing and I love how you're breaking it down so yeah. that people can understand. Um, and that's what I'm going to tell all you guys to do. Um, what's the name of your book again, Dr. Carl Hart? Uh, where, where, where can they find it? Uh, drug use for grownups. Uh, it's everywhere. Go support your local bookstore. Uh, you can find me at drcarlhart.com. Uh, uh, the book is there. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Love y'all, man. <laughs> Take you Somebody said, throw it in a circle is a condition, Rebecca. <laughs> Calling me honey, why you show off your money? Waving like it's a tissue, baby, this is your issue. I'm not falling for bullshit, if you yeah. like me then say it. You don't get that I see it through, this facade that surrounds you. But when I take time, so you waste mine. You and me ain't right, now you're wearing gold. And nothing more oh, right. <laughs> So All right, y'all. Y'all already know what time it is. <sighs> Corporate America time. But today is DJ exclusive time. Uh, shout out Ben and Rebecca. I love y'all, man. Thank y'all for the love and support that you guys provide. Of course, uh, Dwayne and, and Max and David, all you guys as well, too. Definitely can't do it without y'all. So definitely appreciate you. And of course, wouldn't be able to do anything without the Pride, Pride, Pride family. So shout out to all of y'all, man. Thank y'all for all the love, everything that y'all do to support. Man, we really